Remember, the content on our show is for information only. It is not intended to provide medical or other professional advice. Hello, and welcome to Placebo, the podcast where we take turns teaching each other something new about healthcare or medicine. I'm Kaylin Richards, and this is my brother. And I'm Logan Richards. And I think, brother, to start out with this week, we should talk about our experiment from last week. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you follow through on it? I did. Okay. And do you have any uh, data to report? Well, Wait, I... I should explain what it is in case people haven't heard it. Yeah, so you should remind them of what we did. So if you didn't hear our last week's episode, you should go back and listen, but... Um, it was about blue light, the light that uh, comes out of a lot of screens, especially maybe computers and cell phones. And so we talked about using the, what is it, the nighttime feature? Yeah, I forget what blue it's Blue light filter now. on the cell phones mm-hmm. uh, to see if it improved our sleep because that's what it's supposed to be. If you're not using screens before sleep or are using this filter, it's supposed to help right. you enter REM sleep more quickly, right? Right. Okay. So we were, our experiment was to use the cell phone filter to filter out the blue light. And That's then it, you just said that. And then also to uh, not use any screens for 30 minutes before going to sleep. Yes. Right? Okay. So number one, did you do that? I did it. And I, and I used my watch to track my sleep. Whoa. Okay. You're going to have much better data than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you go first then. Okay, because mine is going to be much less interesting. So I did try and do it, but I thought that the cell, the the filter would stay on continuously once I set it, and I found it seemed to turn off every day after the next day. Like it would stay on maybe until the end of that day, and then it would turn off, and then I would have to turn Uh, it back on. Maybe there's some. Well, I think so. I couldn't quite figure out the settings. The one that I was using would be on at like. When when it was dark outside, and then it would turn off on the daytime. So you sure yeah. yours wasn't doing that? Yeah, because I would turn it on in the morning because I would notice it wasn't on, and then in the evening I would notice it's well, not you're, on. You're getting up before before sunrise. No, like I would notice it like well, then it shouldn't be on. It only it only is on from sunset to sunrise. Yeah, uh, it seems to only turn on when you turn it on, and at the end of the day it resets and goes off again. Mm, I'm not sure we can trust any of your data. So maybe only one or two days we're, at, we're, we're using that. I did try not do screen time for the 30 minutes before bed. I have to say it maybe was not a great week for me to do it because <laughs> I'm particularly tired because I worked both last weekend, the two last weekends. So much complaining. And so I was really tired anyways. And my cat has been behaving oddly and waking me up many times in the night. Okay, so you have... So, I don't think that was very, very good data. I noticed no benefit to my sleep and, in fact, worse sleep, but I think that was more because of my cat waking me up. (laughs) And you don't feel more refreshed during the day. I I feel super tired, actually. (laughs) But um, that was my experience. I don't think it was a, a good collection. What did you find? Well, okay, so I, to start with, I really don't notice anything different. Mm -hmm. In fact, the last two days, I've actually felt a little bit more tired than I usually do, and I don't know why that is. But I do have, um, I did track my sleep using um, a fitness device Okay. uh, over the last four days. Okay. So I have an average of eight hours and 38 minutes of sleep. Oh, that's good. And... It looks like I usually do a 50-50 split between what this app is calling light sleep and deep sleep. I'm not particularly sure exactly (laughs) what that means. I'm assuming that REM would be deep sleep. They have cool little graphs of (laughs) movement, too. So it looks like whenever they're saying deep sleep, I'm moving less in the middle of the night. Okay. So it could be, yeah. Yeah. So the only problem with my experiment is that I didn't track before. So I was figuring <laughs> yeah. if we want to keep going, at least for myself, I might as well look the next couple of weeks using the screen up until the point I fall asleep. Yeah. I really don't notice any difference, you know, anecdotally from how I felt before this. Yeah. But it is interesting to see that I do seem to get more sleep than I thought. That's good. Because I usually... 
you thought you would get less than that. Yeah, well, you're, you're I not seem to be in over... school right now, though. No. That might help. But I still wake up. It's My average wake-up time is like 6.08, so I still wake up pretty early. Yeah. But, yeah. So well, I thought that was interesting. But maybe if <laughs> maybe I'll get less R. deep M. sleep if I if I use screens. Or... Well, since you have this cool app, maybe you should try using screens and not using the blue light filter for the next week and see what it see what it says. Sounds good. Okay. But I don't notice anything. Okay. <laughs> I would say <laughs> another problem for me in not using the screen time is I feel like I tended to stay awake a little bit longer because I was reading instead. And I tend to get wrapped up in a book and not stop when I should more so than if I was just reading a random news article or something on my computer. Yeah. I find the same thing with watching TV. If I'm watching a new show that's interesting, then that will keep me awake longer. Than... But I try not to do that at night. So I, yeah, if I'm going to watch TV until I fall asleep, I try to be watching something I've already seen because then I'll, uh, it'll still be like calming, but I'll fall asleep faster you won't want to stay awake because i won't care if i miss it (laughs) yeah (laughs) so i don't know um i'll be interested to see if your deep sleep numbers if rem sleep is what they're measuring is any different yeah we we could talk about that next week i guess i'll i'll use screens while i'm sleeping okay just have it strapped right in (laughs) front of your eyes all night i'll put on one of those those uh vr headsets and just wear it to bed the blue light blazing into my eyeballs that's gonna be real comfy Okay, so let's get into the topic for this this episode. Oh yeah, I okay. forgot why we were here. Well, you know, most podcasts, they like to start out with some just light conversation. So I think that's a good start. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of the times, a lot of the times, pretty much all the time, we talk about research on our show, right? Yes. Healthcare research in, in particular. Yes. And a lot of that time, that research is using animal models, at least for beginning parts of the research before they they go to work in humans Mm -hmm. that sounds correct okay and we always make a comment or a lot of times we'll say like you know this is just in mice or rats it may be different in people it's a promising study but it you know may not apply to people whatever sure so uh i wanted to take a look and see what are the actual research like statistics on that are the animal models that we use even helpful at all in determining healthcare needs and the outcome of research in people. Oh, very interesting topic. So it's not actually looking at healthcare exactly, but more like the underpinnings of how we find out things about healthcare. Yeah. Okay. It's all related. All right. So I also, I mean, there's obviously the question of like, is even the data that we get from, from animal models useful? And then there's the other like ethical question, should we be using animals to, to do studies on? Okay. Especially if they're not necessarily valid or helpful. Right. And, you know, I love animals. I hate the idea of causing suffering in an animal, especially if it's not doing anything to help anybody else, you know. Right. So let's take a look at some research. Okay. Okay. Um, our question kind of that I was looking at, are animal studies really helpful in advancing healthcare or medicine? I'm excited to find out. <laughs> so here is... I think no. You think no. Okay. Well, one thing I will say is that animal models have increased our understanding of like how a disease works, like being able to see how a disease might progress in a mouse or whatever can be helpful in, in understanding how a similar disease might progress in a human. Mm-hmm. Um, that sounds helpful. Yes. But what is much less clear is how like drug trials or trials of different treatments in mice or rats or whatever animal actually translates to people. That okay. seems to be much more controversial. In a review, which is where they take right a bunch of studies and look at all the results combined together. Mm-hmm. So they did a review of animal studies published in seven leading journals. They published it in seven journals? No, they, they combined oh, animal studies from, from seven. seven leading scientific journals. <laughs> like, don't you think one is enough? <laughs> yeah. They found that about one third of those studies made it to the point where they did human randomized trials. Okay. So this is all with, with um, research on drugs. Uh, yeah. Mostly drug trials. Okay. Only about one third of those were made it to human trials. And about one-tenth of those got to use in, in patients. So you can see okay. that there are a huge number 
of trials that were thought to be worth testing in animals that were uh, not valid at all, and then that some that worked in, animal, in animals and then were still not valid in people. Isn't that just kind of the nature of clinical trials, though? They start with a bunch of random things that they think might work, mm -hmm. and the ones that continue to pass the tests that they have are the ones that make it to people. Well, so but, it sounds like just, yeah. you, mean, you can't, not everything is a winner, right? Not everything is a winner, but here's the thing. So, like, for example, this is um, about ischemic stroke. So when there's a blood clot in the brain that blocks blood flow to an area. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there have been about 500 uh, treatment strategies that have been successfully reported in animals that work well to prevent ischemic stroke. But only two of them have proved effective in action in patients in human studies, mm. which is aspirin and TPA, which is tissue plasminogen activator. Right. <laughs> so 500 that do work in animals, only two work in people. And so the point of that is why? Like if they work in animals, why don't they work in people? If they, if the so you're saying odds that are so seems too low. What's that? You're saying that that number seems too low. Well, I don't know that it seems too low. I think what it in, what it indicates to me is that the there is a big difference, as we always say, between a mouse and a person. And so obviously, things that work in a mouse don't necessarily work in a person. So if so, why are we studying things in a mouse to see if they'll work in a person? Because that's pretty bad odds. You spend time researching 500 different types of treatments. Two of them work in. Yeah. And those are the ones that worked in animals. There were many, many more things that didn't work in the animals, you know, that never even got to the human stage. Mm -hmm. For cancer trials, another example, the average rate of successful translation from animal models to clinical cancer trials is less than 8%. So it's a really small amount go from successful animal trial to actually working in people. Yeah. I remember on, there's a, there's definitely a, a at least partial Freakonomics ep episode about w someone was saying that they didn't think it was a useful idea for us to use mouse models or rodent models to try and discover new cancer drugs mm -hmm. because it was just too low. And yeah, we'll get we'll get down to that, right? Okay. Yeah. Basically, these preclinical animal trials they take huge investments in time and money and the lives of these animals, I would like to point out too. Mm -hmm. And they really rarely translate into anything successful. But is it cheaper than, what's the alternative, I guess? Well, the alternative is at the end. We got to talk some <laughs> more about the, what the what the issues are. First, I want to talk about why, why they don't translate very well. It, it's, you know, it's, I feel like not just enough to say mice are different from people. Like they are mammals. Why are they, why are the studies so so inaccurate or so unhelpful most of the time. Do you have some ideas? Mm, well, I don't have any specific ideas. I mean, obviously, there's genetic differences. There um, are genetic differences. I want you to think about, like, the study design themselves. That's kind of where a lot of the problems come in. Well, there's prob there's, there always seems to be more variables in humans than in, in mm -hmm. a rodent model. It's probably especially... You know, like some of the ones we were talking about over the last several weeks where it's like the whole rat was exposed to, you know, this specific level of radiation for like 100 hours straight or right. whatever. Is that which, really what, like, yeah. Which is, of course, so they often, I feel like, exaggerate the variables in order to try and, like, prove a certain variable is, but then is it making actually... a difference or not, right? Yeah. So the... Probably the the rodent and controlled studies like that are just a lot more specific than you can be with any normal human. Yeah. For example, one thing they like to talk about was a lot of the studies, well, we're looking at the ischemic stroke again. A lot of the animal studies kind of fail to take into account the delay that will occur in people from when something occurs to when the treatment can be started. Oh, right. So in animal studies, the, it was a really like large review of a ton of animal studies looking at ischemic stroke treatments. The median starting time from like when the stroke occurred to when the treatment started was 10 minutes. Oh. Uh, in people... <laughs> More than that, because I know, isn't TPA like two hours or something? The window for TPA, so um, when they can use this drug and it's useful, is between, to a maximum of maybe four and a half hours uh, from when the symptoms occur. And a lot of times... And it's, not everybody not everybody gets there in time. No, for it, right? most people don't. Like maybe, 
you're at home, you're asleep. Yeah. And you wake up and clearly something's happened to you. You don't know when that stroke might have occurred. Or someone was home alone and they're found by a family member. They don't know when that happened. I always found, yeah, yeah like, especially if you're by yourself, how are you, how is, and you're having a stroke, how are you ever able to say when it started? Yeah, it's really, in, so. unless someone last saw you at a healthy at a certain time, that's the only way they would know. Even, right. say, best case scenario, you are in the hospital for some other reason and you have a stroke, you're probably alone in your room. Maybe someone saw you a while before that, but... Maybe the nurse was in there 45 minutes before that and saw you and you seemed fine. Yeah. But even you are in the hospital, that's 45 minutes from when you were last seen fine to when the nurse first noticed something was wrong. It might take a little longer. It will take a little longer before they can call a code, get you down for imaging, get you to treatment. So it's way more than the 10 minutes, even in the best case circumstance. Right. Okay. So that's one reason the animal studies are not mimicking the actual real life circumstances okay that makes sense um, let alone that that's really not anything to do with the difference in complexity in humans or anything it's just like real world right another thing they talked about with like the stroke trials is that they in order to so in the stroke trials in mice the way that they would measure the how good a treatment was was they would just look at the brain imaging of the mouse and look at the volume that the stroke had affected, the brain volume that had been affected. Mm. And in people, they look at the function. So it doesn't really translate and exactly right. Yeah, some people can have actually a really small stroke, a really small area of their brain is damaged, but they actually have a huge functional change. And the opposite is also true. Some people will have a huge stroke, and you expect, like, I'll look at the imaging before I go see a patient. It's a huge stroke. I expect they're probably going to be really impaired, and they're not, which is always surprising. So yeah. the volume of the stroke doesn't necessarily and often doesn't correspond to how damaged someone is. So that's just the measures aren't really lining up. It's hard to measure measure an equivalent version of function in a mouse and a human, yeah. too. I mean, right, because often strokes might affect fine motor control. Well, mice don't use their paws in the same way people use their you know <laughs> hands so it's just it, it could never be accurately measured you couldn't get a right mouse to do a nine hole peg test to measure their dexterity <laughs> or <laughs> okay so here are a couple other reasons why the studies don't don't translate well from humans to or animals to humans okay I'm so, ready. okay so we talked about like the study design just doesn't really fit with the actual real world applications yes um, there's also times when maybe there is insufficient data um, collected, but maybe overenthusiastic researchers drawing conclusions. So I think like about the about the study. Okay. So with the mice. Yeah, I think that maybe is an applic is related to like the study we talked about with the cell phones. Yeah. Like the the conclusion the conclusions that the study drew. The numbers seem to be pretty much on the fence for me, but the researchers seem to be really enthusiastic in drawing their conclusions that cell phones were probably dangerous. That's the human bias probably too. They've all put in so much effort into They've put in so much effort. They have a hypothesis that they they hope to see proved. I mean Yeah. And it's not like they're lying, but statistics are It's I an interpretation. They're a tricky thing. Yeah. yeah, statistics are tricky. It's an interpretation always. And that something is reliable or valid or not. Yeah. And so that's another problem. Lack of generalizability so that the way that the disease presents in the animal is just not similar enough to how it presents in the human. Mm. They talked about how, like, for Parkinson's disease, they will, in, in humans, it's kind of a gradual onset, long-term chronic disease as the areas of the brain are kind of slowly damaged over time. Right. In animals, they don't really have that disease model, so they'll just cause damage in the particular area of the brain that produces the dopamine. Right. So it's like almost like a stroke in that area, a sudden onset change. Which so is it's, not actually. It's not how it presents in people at all, so the, it doesn't translate. Okay. And then one other thing that they uh, described as publication bias. So when you have a study that just doesn't show anything... No it's, one wants to publish. No one that. wants to publish it. It's a lot more likely to not to not get published. The journals might not want to publish it because it's not very. I've heard that that's compelling. changing a little bit, though. I hope that it is because the the problem is that that's such a waste of 
the researcher of time of the animals' lives that were involved in that study, because it may be repeated if no one knows that this didn't work. Yeah. Someone else might think, ah, oh, this might work and give it a try. I forget exactly the solution that I've heard about, but I, it's, I think it's something like early publication where you present your methods and stuff before you've got your results. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. where the experiment still, you know, is, sounds promising or whatever. Yeah. And then after and then you that, you have, a, and... you have a guaranteed spot to publish your results. That's good. I think that I've heard some journals are doing that and that, that you know, there's, there's a trend going to where they want some type of model, some type of incentive model so that you have to publish your results even if they're not favorable to Either right. what you want or to, you know, a positive result. I mean, a lot of researchers work for drug companies that just want positive results. A lot of researchers want to or get food. funding. Food. Food companies. Food companies have yeah. been such a mess. Did you hear recently there was a story where it was like the, it was a sugar production company paid researchers to say that fat was bad. And then at the same time, the oh, fat well, yeah. company was saying that sugar was bad. And so like... I don't know how we, any of that research doesn't seem real anymore. Yeah, I can. I mean, I see Probably how that can happen. That kind of thing in all sorts of studies. I was talking with some people at lunch, the, people at work at lunch the other day about how, like, when we were young, everything was like low, low fat, no fat was all the way, and now everybody's like full fat, eat all the whole milk, all the whole milk yogurt, you know, whatever. It just happens to be whoever's company is lobbying hardest to the researchers. A little bit, at yeah. The time. So, I mean, researchers want to get grants. People don't – grant awarding agencies don't really want to give grants probably to people that have ineffective research. Yeah. So that all of that is to say that there's a bias to publish results that are showing something and not publish results that are negative, um, which kind of skews results. So here are some suggestions to improve animal trials. And then at the end, we're going to talk about are animal trials even really valid anymore. Sounds good. Okay. One thing you want to look at is – Internal validity. Do you know oh, what that is? Yes. <laughs> okay. You don't like that I'm bringing up the cool statistics terms? Internal validity. <laughs> I've, I'm afraid I've really forgotten. That's... Well, I had two, but I wrote it down here so I would remember. <laughs> At one point, I probably wrote it down. <laughs> here, here's what it says. Here's the, quota the quoted definition. Good. The extent to which the design and conduct of the trial eliminate the possibility of bias. Ah, okay. So we've just been talking about bias. Things like randomization, uh, blinding the studies, those are things oh. that are about internal validity. Okay. So okay. randomization means um, how are you assigning the different animals to like the different study group or control group or whatever in your study. Right. I remember in the cell phone studies that I read with the reviewer comments. The attached. control group was bad, right? Yeah, there was a lot of questions from the re reviewers about how did you select your animals for each group. It seems like weird. Why did the control group all die so young? Mm -hmm. So there were some studies that randomization was maybe taken less strongly than it should have been, where they like randomly picking an animal up from the cage was what they called randomization. That's not how you should randomize. Uh, how do you randomize mouse properly? Mice. Well, they must be all identified in some way. I don't know how you identify your mice. Maybe they have a collar or a, a number of some kind so you can identify the individuals. Maybe they have a tattoo. I think they've done that before. That seems reasonable. Yeah. Tattoo with a number. So you'd put all the different numbers, you know, for all the mice that you have in a random number generator. And it would just generate 10 mice for this group and 10 mice for this group. So you're not picking at all. They said what can happen sometimes is people consciously or unconsciously will... But you can't let the human pick. Well, that's why it's computer randomly generated. Yeah, humans, but, humans are the worst at Yeah, so random. if you're just randomly picking mice out of the cage, for example, and you're going to put 10 mice in one box and 10 mice in the other, people will, they said consciously or sub, you know, unconsciously, pick mice that maybe look healthier for one group or mice that look yeah. smaller for one group without even meaning to do it necessarily, it but... Can't trust the humans. Yeah. So most, a large percentage of animal studies didn't have any information about how they randomized. They would just say randomized and there was no description of that. So there was a lot of questions brought up about how are animal studies randomizing? Are they really randomizing? If you're not saying what you do, th that's not good science. You need to say what you're doing so it can be duplicated. Right. Also blinding. So blinding is when you don't know which group is getting which treatment when the people in that group don't know what treatment they're getting. 
Uh, of course, with mice, that's less of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would imagine. <laughs> this article did note that mice are not um, susceptible to the placebo effect. Although I would say, what if, you know, the researcher is like really kind to the mouse in one group and like really rough to the mouse in the other group? Placebo effect is the treatment environment too. Remember? Yeah, right. And another thing brought up was that caged mice in a laboratory environment are often under stress. That so that can affect how they See? respond to any treatment. Treatment environment right there. Right? That's, okay. That's part of the placebo effect. There you go. So another thing about the internal validity is thinking about your sample size in your study. Mm. So you want a big enough sample size that it shows good statistics, that it's um, valid over the population, but you don't want too big because that would be, well, unethical, especially if you're you know, using animals, that's their lives. Probably expensive. It would be expensive and unnecessary. And if it was too small, it also could be a waste because you're not getting valuable information. Those animals' lives are also not being used, you know. Right. So just to give a couple of examples um, of like the randomization and blinding, blinding stuff in actual studies, there was a review of different interventions used in animal tested in animal models for either ischemic stroke, emergency medicine. They didn't specify about that. Okay. Uh, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, or uh, ALS. Um, so a third or less of these studies reported random allocation. A third or less? What does that mean? It was a... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> a third or none. <laughs> Maybe it was unclear in some of them. Okay. Well, they... it's unclear now also. Okay. <laughs> So about a third reported, it let me re try again. It remains unclear. Yeah. About a third reported random allocation to the treatment group and few, fewer than a third reported that they had any blindedness in the study at all. Mm. Yeah. By the researchers. By the researchers. Right, so. Yeah. They also talk about, in people, they'll talk a lot about inclusion or exclusion criteria for, the, for a study. Like right. you can't have these other other conditions as well. You have to be within this age group, whatever, right. something like that. That's usually not mentioned at all in animal studies. So there's not much ability to compare on that. Um, you don't even know, you know, what else might be going on or not happening with these animals. I suppose. I guess, is this all not mentioned because it seems like an assumption that, that these things are, you know, carried out the way they're supposed to be carried out? Maybe, but it shouldn't be. Because in human studies, it's always always gone through but humans have th these variables that we talked about and perhaps mice don't maybe they're bred in a way such that... oh well, you're right this is the thing right maybe they don't but in that case are the is the information valid to people also because they talked about i'm with... just getting at your question then. yeah so if they with... if they assume that they're they don't need to do any of this because these mice are already perfectly randomized and genetically the same or whatever sure then is that information valuable at all because they for example with the ischemic stroke again right they have so many things that they've tried that worked well in the in the mouse model for example and uh -huh. not at all in people so one thing they talked about was like in humans a lot of the people that have stroke are older like over 65 say a lot of the people that have stroke also have high blood pressure also have diabetes that's really common so did these mice have any of those conditions no they're all young mouse you know, young mice that probably didn't have these other conditions but we don't know because it wasn't said right so a treatment that might work in a young healthy person even might not work in a person that's 80 years old and has high blood pressure and diabetes mm, and that's whatever. also interesting yeah because there's got to be some type of yeah like if you're testing for a disease that usually affects people later in life, then can you use mice that are in their earlier part of their life? Right. It would suggest no. Yeah. Yeah. So then you have to wait till the mouse or mice are a certain age. But I don't know how long a mouse lifespan is. It's not that long. Well, you were saying that those... In the study, the cell phone study, they had very young mice, like from from right. when they were still in their mother. Young bodies are much more resilient than older bodies, too. Right. I would assume that's true even in a mouse. So we've talked some about internal validity. Oh, no, another statistical construct? Well, how about external validity? Okay, Kay. what does that mean? So that is, in quotes again, the extent to which the results of an animal experiment 
provide a correct basis for generalization to the human condition. Okay. Okay. So we kind of already started talking about this. Yeah. Kind this, of, and then we did. <laughs> this just is your question, like, is this research worth anything? Can mm-hmm. we take the results that we get from the mice and and it means something for the human patients? Right. So, I mean, the points that are brought up, we've already kind of talked about a lot of them. Comorbidities, so people have maybe multiple conditions, and the mouse studies are maybe young, healthy mice. The assessment of a treatment in a homogenous group of animals versus a heterogeneous group of people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like the mice maybe are all bred and pretty genetically similar and not really any difference, whereas the human population that might be seen if they can benefit from this treatment or not is very broad and wide-ranging and different, you know, genetically. Well, overall, our genetics are pretty much are similar, right? Well, but there are lots. So, for but example, our, there was a... Oh, go ahead. It's just our other variables... And things that have changed. Yeah. So they, there was a study for ALS, and the way that they study ALS in mice is they have a particular gene that occurs in 1% to 3% of people with ALS, and they have replicated that gene 23 times in these study population of mice, and those are the mice they used to study ALS. And... So again, it's not exactly the same. It's not even close to the same because what they said that, um, you know, because this mouse has so many replication of this gene that it's possible that any treatment probably is not going to be sufficient to overcome such a high amount of this gene expressing itself. Hmm. And that also this is only in a very small percentage of people with ALS have this particular expression of the gene. So even if they found a treatment that worked, It might only work in a very small population of people with this very specific disease. Right. So the the thing that they they have found that actually works in these mice sometimes is broad spectrum antibiotics and anti inflammatories. And they think that's because the mouse is so susceptible to other diseases like infections, um, just general infections, because they have such high uh, expression of this ALS gene. That that's the only thing that's really helping them is they're trying to get other infections uh, down, not that they're actually treating the ALS. So again, not not super useful. Yeah. A lot of studies will either use only male or only female animals just because that's their study. That's an easy population to get. You can get a bunch of female mice, whatever. Okay. Whereas the disease might occur in male and female patients <laughs> and often does. <laughs> and then we talked a little bit about this with Parkinson's, but they'll induce a disease that is not similar enough to how it occurs in people. Yeah. So well, it sounds like that's a problem with ALS too. Right, right. Or stroke. Right. We talked about the delay to the, to the start of treatment that are unrealistic in the clinic or the use of doses that are toxic or not tolerated by human patients. There was a drug. That's like the radiation ones too. Right. This is really unfortunate. There was a drug trial. Um, this drug had the really fabulous name of TGN1412. Ah, well, it would have been rebranded later. Probably. If it had made it. It was a drug for treatment of immunological diseases. They would Um, have called it Immunolox. Sure. It was for treating MS, um, rheumatoid arthritis, and then certain types of cancer. Here's what it's described as. An immunomodulatory humanized agonistic anti-CD28 monoclonal antibody. Mm. Does that help you understand it? It does, yes. Okay. Thank you. (laughs) So um, before they did the human trials, it was tested on several different animals, including mice, to make sure that it was safe and that it was uh, efficacious in the animal models. It was working for them well. They did toxicity studies that said the doses that were 100 times higher than those administered to humans didn't cause any toxic reactions in the animal models. Okay. And then they started a human trial because everything seemed good. And the drug caused catastrophic system organ failure, despite Ah. being given at a dose that was 500 times lower than the dose found safe in animal studies. Yikes. So even though something seems like it will work... (laughs) It does And not. it's safe. Yeah, not for sure at all. So this study pointed out that although study design issues are often brought up as a root cause of clinical trial failures, we've talked a lot about study design, mm-hmm. they think that maybe a lot of a lot of trials don't work when they translate to humans because of like the actual mechanism of the drugs. They just don't work the same in people as they do in animals. 
It's different enough for whatever it's reason. It's different enough, yeah. They thought that maybe there is a more complex immunological system in people than in, in mice, and there was a lot more antibodies in the body and a longer cascade chain of something they were talking about that... We're certainly bigger. Just for bigger. <laughs> we are more complex as an organism. Right. And More cells. More cells. And so it just doesn't work the same, you know? That seems like a reasonable hypothesis to make. Yeah. So is that just speculation at this point? Or is, is what speculation? That the humans are too, are too complex theory. I think that it is speculation based up on, based up on evidence from these, some of these trials, you know? The evidence that they're just saying, well, because well, they this don't drug know... works so differently yeah. in humans than in mice, we think humans are more complex, but they don't have any. Well, I mean, they did have a, they were speculating on different ways the immune system functions in humans versus mice might have had a different mm. effect. But you can think... This is just a generalized way to say that... People, you know, some things that are... I don't know if this really is good, but dogs can take Benadryl. People can take Benadryl. Dogs can take a huge amount of Benadryl compared to people and not have that much of an effect. It just is processed differently in a dog than in a person. Even where the same drug works in both species and feel like a dog might be more similar to a person than a mouse is, but I'm not sure. They're bigger. <laughs> <laughs> bigger is clearly the uh, They're a little the closer to the same size. <laughs> it's still, it doesn't work the same, you know? I didn't know that. Yeah. The dogs can take away more. Now, don't just go feed your dog a ton of Benadryl. Please speak with your vet. But I know that the, the amount that a dog should take is more than a person should take. Huh. You're just... Uh... Begging to bring up the individual differences between humans, too. Oh, sure. Sizes and I'm a larger Genetic guy. Genetic variation, yeah. You can, larger people can theoretically take a higher dose for the same therapeutic effect because the breakdown of the drug over the entire body and <laughs> gives less to certain areas, right? I remember a particular episode of MASH. Where they were giving a... Well, everyone knows MASH is perfectly... Well, I looked this up. It's based up on an actual thing that happened. They were giving a, a vaccine for malaria, I think. They were giving a vaccine to everyone in the camp. Uh -huh. And the people that were of, like, African-American descent had uh, this, like, terrible reaction where they got really sick, like a terrible flu. They were... People thought they were... It was Klinger. Oh, he also got sick. He's not African American. I don't know. They thought he was. Um, see, he was like he was from Ohio, but he was like Armenian or yeah, something. Yeah, he's from the Middle East, I think. They thought he was making up that he was sick to get out of work, but he actually was sick from this um, vaccine that they found only affected people that were not Caucasian in this way, I guess. Oh, okay. And it is. It was based on some actual thing that happened, but I don't remember the details. Well, that just brings... But that's yeah, just, just point. differences There's... between different, you know, human populations. Right. Right. It, the... And even individual people, not, you know, based on genetic things. Yeah. Well, it is based I guess on it's all genetic, genetic but, things, but more specific mutations. There are like, I've heard about um, cancer treatments being made to the exact individual, right? Looking at their exact mm -hmm. genome and then making a treatment that works just specifically for them as, right. a, as a way of the future, too. Well, that's what I've seen with that is that they they take a bunch of various cancer drugs that we have, see which one is most effective based on the their genetics and the genetics of the tumor, and then just give them those ones. They're not making a new drug, although I'm sure that's the way of the future. That's right. I hope. We'll see. So how to improve. Yes. I've been wondering that this whole time. I know. You tried to skip to the end at the very beginning. <laughs> So first of all, it should be, to be a quality study, all of the aspects that are reported in a human trial should be also reported in an animal trial. Okay. Okay, so this includes like sample size. How was the sample size determined? What assumptions were made? How were people or animals eligible for this study? What were exclusion criteria? How did you randomize your pop po patient population? How did you put them in the different groups? How was blinding done? How did you move the animals from one stage of the study to the other? How are the animals treated? Like, it needs to be all very specific so that it's replicatable and it is 
people can understand how this could apply or not apply to humans. If the data is not put in the study, no one will know. Okay, that right? makes sense. So that is how they suggest, like, to make an animal study better, basically, is to be really clear about all the details of it, okay? But are animal studies really the best practice, the best that we can do? Are they ethically and scientifically uh, indicated at this stage? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? What do you think? Well, now I'll uh, let you speculate. It certainly seems like they've they've led to most of the medical knowledge that we have at this point. They've led to a lot, but could we do better is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly seems like we could, and we've already... Just because coal power was the way to go in the past, <laughs> does that mean we should keep doing that, you know? Yeah. Well, some people would say yes, I guess, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it certainly seems like we could do better. The thing that, I mean... There must be a reason why we continue to do it, whether that's tradition or or just kind of the momentum of how, you know, so science has always worked So it is tradition this way. and it's law in some places. So the FDA and Health Canada, which is the organization in Canada that's similar to the FDA, they both require currently that animal tests be conducted before humans are exposed to a new, like, drug. I'm assuming that would be similar in other countries, but those are the ones that I knew. Yeah. But studies have shown that animal models are not validated as a necessary step in biomedical research. There's no studies that show that there is an essential benefit of doing animal studies first and then go to humans because they're different. Right. Um, there is a growing awareness of the limitations of, hum- of animal studies, you know, that we've talked about so many of them. And I think that the reason that they were started and the reason that people still cling to them is their hope to make a prediction as to how a clinical trial will go in humans. But I think more and more it's been shown that they just don't predict what's going to happen in humans. Yeah. And yeah. it certainly seems like there's easier ways now, too, with yes. all these different... Um, the way the thing that we learned about in school was called either disease in a dish or I think that was the name that they've been calling it, where they they either take, you know, a sample of whatever the problematic cells are from the actual person that they're treating grow those cells in a Petri dish Mm -hmm. and then do their own little experiment to figure out which drug will work best. So we have a couple different things that are along those lines. Okay. So first I want to talk about phase zero studies, which is the one exception to allowing having to have human or animal trials first before you expose humans to a new drug. Okay. So this has been approved in the last 10 years or so in the FDA and also the European Medicines Agency. So they can do trials that have very tiny, tiny, tiny doses of a new drug they want to try, and they give it to people. Okay. With the idea that they can study how the drug interacts with various receptors in people, how if it affects or if it acts as they think it will on different receptors and whatever before they go further with a trial, before they try higher doses. So it's Mm. supposed to be a safe dose because it's so, 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 so low. I assume there's only certain types of drugs that can be approved for this. I would assume, but I don't know more details <laughs> about that. <laughs> okay. So other other options to avoid animal studies entirely. Okay. Okay. Epidemiological studies. That was like the interphone study that we talked about uh, with the cell phones, where they're just basically looking at history, populations, how things have progressed in the past, how different drugs work in the past, or... That doesn't seem like a great idea for inventing new drugs. I don't think it will work very well for inventing new drugs, um, but for different environmental things, I think it works to find out the health risks. Yeah. Um, Obviously, there are limitations to that, as we talked about in that episode. Well, I feel like they do that. They do that with some drugs anyways. I know that there's like after... There's a period after drug goes to market where they're still monitoring high sure. numbers of people. So they're yeah, I mean, sometimes a drug that. comes out and then it's recalled, right? right? Because it's found that it actually isn't. Yeah, because safe. once it goes to market, then they can monitor a lot, a much larger number of people. Right. Um, other things that could be done: autopsies. Ah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's okay. kind of. We hope to limit those, but. <laughs> still, probably um, not a great way to. Invent new drugs. Okay. In vitro studies, so you're in a test tube setting. In silico, computer modeling is what that means. Cool. Uh, I would wonder how specific that can get. Well, I think there's the 
there's the potential to get more and more specific with that as we have more and more of the human genome uh, mapped as we can that makes sense uh, do individual genetic analysis much more easily it would seem like we need more powerful computers even than the ones we have today in order to fully take advantage <laughs> yeah, of that do yeah all those variables um but oh. it would be if it could be done successfully it would be much more accurate than mm -hmm. animal models by far and they could yeah and it wouldn't be if affecting it, anyone's life if it way. was yeah if it was actually successful too then that could be you could have your study numbers would be infinite pretty much could be infinite or it could be like you have this specific disease let's run your dna let's find out what the specific treatment you yeah. need is well that's very interesting i've never heard of that before and then we have two other things which maybe are what you were talking about a little bit where they can create human i don't quite understand it human organs on a microchip. Yeah, that's what... Um, so they're studying yeah. kind of more parts than a whole system, but they also can... That's study. what we've been told about okay. in school. They also have something called microfluidic chips, which is how you can automate... Uh, we can create cell cultures in silicone in integrated circuits with plumbing. I don't understand exactly. This is what the description says. <laughs> I don't have enough information on that either. So and to I think me, as both of those seem to be like you're studying certain parts of the body, not a body as a whole. Yeah. I think that's pretty much it. And, and as as physical therapy students, I don't think they were interested in, in going into the specifics <laughs> with us. Yeah. I think they were just trying, the one we did hear about it, they were trying to throw out like, well, you know, this is some of the stuff we're doing with drugs now where we're taking we're taking cells, growing more of them, and, and doing our own little mini experiment to see which drugs will work best. And that, you know, maybe in the future as as a PT or something, and actually these computer models sound a lot more reasonable for PTs, will be able to do the same type of thing where, you know, you have this injury and these genetics and we, you might be able to do some type of test to figure out which treatment you should use this first. This is the best treatment that's going to work best with so, your particular body structure. Yeah, I think they were just suggesting in the future you, you might do something like this as a PT, of course. It'll mm -hmm. probably be very different, but you know that <laughs> idea that yeah, some you'll get some information from the patient, and then and then use that information to make a like an, a a more evidence based choice on w what's correct instead of just going with these big population. You know what works best for everybody on average. On average, which doesn't necessarily work best for that person. Right. Yeah. So I, I do think this is the way of the future. Uh, the U.S. National Research Council has recommended that animal model tests be replaced as soon as possible. Oh, that's good. Uh, with either the in vitro um, studies, which are usually human cell-based tests, yeah. uh, with in silico models, the computer models, or with an, and with an increased emphasis on epidemiology. Those are what they would like to focus on, getting rid of animal models entirely as soon as possible. Okay. Um, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in the U.S., has suspended all new grants for biomedical and behavioral research for chimpanzees, um, which I think is, I would oh, for sure agree that. with, right? Because yeah. they had a an expert committee that studied that. They decided that the research was unnecessary and unhelpful um, to do further research with chimpanzees anyways. Uh -huh. Which I think is great because they're our nearest relative. But I think that I just feel I feel like if there's any better option, we shouldn't be doing animal studies. Well, it seems like it seems unethical too, and irresponsible to me. I don't if know. If the way that they want to go is with these, you know, supposing that everything is more efficient and that you know it'd be better to do it, which it sounds like it probably is. It seems like now it's even more of a waste doing these experiments on you know using animal models when we should be maybe putting our resources into figuring out how to transition to these different these mm -hmm. newer systems mm -hmm. instead of wasting our time doing animal models which it sounds like i think they're just so entrenched in the way that people do science that it's going to yeah. be hard to change so currently maybe a scientist has a new drug they want to study they might do some tests like on a lab bench in a test tube type setting okay. then the next step would be in an animal in a mouse for right. example and then to humans okay that but makes sense. i don't think that's the way of the future i think that it doesn't sound like it um the newest recommendations are moving away from that and hopefully that will be a thing of the past i think yeah i wonder how quickly that will take effect 
As we uh, know, science slow. is quite slow to change, and It'll probably the laws are even slower. That seems like a huge yeah. hurdle. Because, like, the law is you have to do animal trials before you can do right. human trials. So, yeah, that will have to change. Seems... But I think we'll need to show that computer models are as good and better than animal models before that law will change. Yeah. Yeah. So but now we're just wasting developed. time on doing the animal models. Well, maybe Should we need to do... just all stop and figure <laughs> out the, figure but out the next model. then there would be no for... drugs uh, or no new treatments Don't produced. you think we can stop for, like... A couple of years and figure it all out, and that would save time in the long run. Mm, then maybe, but I think it's different people that are developing computer models than are the people working, you know, in the lab with mice. It's a different skill set. Yeah, but if they were all working together, it'd probably go faster. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. <laughs> lab mice researchers, <laughs> and just work on computer models or yeah. whatever disease on a microchip. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Well, it was quite an interesting topic. Okay, well, I'm glad. I thought it would be interesting. We've always kind of danced around the issue. Yeah, so it makes talked me... talked about it directly. It makes me always want to say even more so when we're talking about study results in mice or rats. Ugh, it really may, may, may not have anything to do with people. Yeah, which yeah. is kind of weird. We'll probably look back on this time in scientific research the same way that we look back on you know, medical research a hundred years ago or... And be like, what were they doing? Right. Because <laughs> a lot of the times there's a big media blitz when a new exciting study comes out and it's all in mice. And it's like, this is the cure for this. And, you know, maybe. <laughs> but, but the odds are really against it actually working in people. Very interesting. All right. So if you enjoyed the episode... Please share us with a friend or give us a rating on iTunes. The ratings on iTunes would be really nice because that helps other people find the show as well. You can visit our website, placebopodcast.com, for any show notes or additional information on all the episodes. You can also uh, reach us there via the contact page. Yes, we love to hear from listeners. You can find us on Facebook. We have a page there. And thank you to James Aiken for our music. And thank you to you for listening. We'll be back with a new episode next week. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.